But tonight also, I want to talk to you about where God has been taking me and who I believe God is. And I believe, um, while you may only relate to some of these, because this is my journey, I believe that God is teaching me who He is partly by showing me who His Word says I am. Now, if you need a, a big printout on verses of who you are in Christ, I've got 15 pages worth typed out. You can order those for me. Um, it, it, it was a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work to get that. But there was a period of time when I spent a lot of time, you know, going over those verses about what God says about me. And that was so healing to help me see who God really is. But tonight, I want to talk to you about who I believe God really is. First of all, God never condemns us, His children, so we have no fear of condemnation. That's a big one, isn't it? Romans 8, 1. It's His desire to equip all of us believers with spiritual authority and power. And I believe it's for everyone, not just me. And He trusts me, though, as a good steward, making me ruler over many things. I believe that God really trusts us. It's like gifts of trust that we don't have to earn and can't earn. Actually, He set it up. He set it up that He would work through us. He limits Himself most of the time to working through imperfect human beings. His love for me is perfect. I can't improve it with good behavior. It doesn't take it away when I make mistakes or when I fail. His love for me is perfect. And He is casting out my doubts and fears with that perfect love more and more and more every day. Father God carefully protects me. I am safe. I personally believe that I have two very large angels that accompany me everywhere I go, and I rest in peace no matter what the circumstances are. Lou has to tell me every once in a while when I'm anxious, but for the most part, I rest in peace because I know these angels are there. And I work with some people where danger could follow because of the people that I minister to, but those angels are there protecting me. Amen? He protects me so that the power of evil can't hurt me, and I've come to the place where I really do have confidence that God's power, His sovereignty, is not only preeminent, but that it's a one power universe. That God is not just 50-50 with Satan and who knows who will win or who knows who will you know, <laughs> be able to touch me, but God does protect me. You might want to picture an umbrella of protection or a bubble of protection around yourself. And I believe that nothing can touch me except that which is filtered through God's fingers. And He orchestrates the events of my life, and while some of them may look bad on the surface, they are challenges or they're pop tests or um, there's purpose in it that I never suffer pain, tribulation, or any persecution, but what there's a purpose in it. And after all, I have yielded myself to Him to serve Him, even to drink of the cup of His sufferings. But there's always a purpose in it. It's like I compare it sometimes to the pain of birthing a baby, but there's joy in the morning because you know there was a purpose in that pain. He calls and desires for me to dwell in the secret place with Him daily. So many people aren't journaling like I've taught them to do or spending more quiet time with God. Even if they don't do it daily, they're not even doing it every few days because they're not quite sure that God really will meet them there, that He really cares to communicate. They're afraid they'll be stood up, basically. And I believe God not only calls me to spend more time with Him, than I usually do even, or, but he desires to dwell with me, to walk in the garden, as it were, with me, to communicate, to walk in the talk with us in the garden was God's plan from the very beginning, and on his end, nothing has changed. I believe it's his pleasure to constantly purify my heart of selfish, fleshly desires, and I have not worn him out, that it's his pleasure to keep teaching me how to walk in the Spirit and that He 
will continue that which he's begun in me and he enjoys doing it. I believe that God not only loves me, but he likes me. That's a big one, isn't it? You say, well, he has to love you, but I believe he likes me. That he is wanting more and more and more relationship with me. I believe that he wants to visit me to reveal to me his beauty, to reveal to me his countenance. He wants me to be able to see him and hear him. He wants me to inquire of him. He wants me to ask for more and more. He wants me to believe for bigger. I believe God is more than willing to deliver me when I need delivering, when I need protection, when I need personal deliverance, because He delights in me. The Bible says that He wants me to have Him as the apple of His eye, but it also says that I'm the apple of His eye, and I choose to believe it. He has chosen me to take dominion over the earth, and I'm His ambassador. That nothing has changed that Adam and Eve were created to take dominion over the earth. Jesus has died on the cross so that we can take back everything that God's original plan is in force and that I can take dominion over nature, over anything but other people. <laughs> we are not called to try to control other people. That would be like witchcraft. But I can take dominion over nature and natural events and over demonic spirits that they all have to bow at the name of Jesus, not because my behavior is perfect or anything about me, but because I'm declaring the name of Jesus and He dwells in me. I believe that He gave me spiritual authority to forgive and that it's not presumption, but when people ask for forgiveness, when I'm praying for them and they ask for forgiveness five ways, or they renounce and break the power of things, that He has given me spiritual power and authority to speak for Him and to say, you are forgiven. And to command healing, that He didn't say for us to beg for healing, or to ask, ask, ask for healing, or try to earn healing, but that He has given us authority to command healing and to command spirits of infirmity to go. I believe that God cherishes me. He cherishes me, not only as a child, some of you feel like a stepchild, but it says we're adopted, and that means that adopted children actually have more rights, you know, than natural children. Adopted children cannot be disowned once they're adopted, and that nothing will separate us, and that He cherishes me, that I'm not just um, a co-heir that I have to share, but I'm a joint heir with Him, and that um, I have an inheritance just because I'm his child and I have, I'm an heir of this power. It's not just delegated to me like it could be taken back. I'm an heir. I believe that he's, his desire is that we will be glorified together. Now, I do not try to take his glory. I don't try to touch his glory. And when I do, I repent of it. But his desire is to share his glory with us. And so... He's in charge of that, and I'll let him do it his way. But he is not that God that would demean you, that would leave you in a precarious position, that would leave you to be embarrassed, but he desires to share his glory with us according to the word. Yes, I am going to give you a handout with scripture verses for all of these. But right now I'm just declaring it so that you can come back to this video and you can agree with these truths. And then if you want to do that Bible study, mark it all in your Bible, I would highly recommend that. My passion is to know Jesus and to grow in His character and His fruit. Because I'm no longer maligning His character, I'm not doubting His character, I want to grow in it. I want to grow in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Gifts are given and fruit is grown. I receive the gifts. I choose to grow in the fruit. My soul thirsts to be in right relation to Him. It's my highest priority, my relationship with God, with Jesus, and therefore with His authorities. I choose to be at peace with all men whenever it's possible, <laughs> as much as it's possible on my side. My relationship, short accounts with God, is my highest priority. He's already equipped me with gifts so that I can leave, lift Jesus up. I'm not believing that God would give me a great commission to be a witness, to teach all nations, to baptize others, 
or whatever your gifts and callings are and not equip me to do it. I believe he equips me liberally that I have everything I need. I'm not lacking anything for life and godliness. Amen? He invites me to stir up the spiritual gifts. That this is not a fleshly work. This is, um, for instance, God says that our praise stirs up his zeal. It's that kind of thing. That I am invited to not only covet the gifts, but to stir them up and to expect the fact that God wants to work through me. He gave me the gifts for me to be a good steward, and He wants to demonstrate them through me. It's not me trying to twist His arm for selfish gain on my part, but it's His desire, and so I stir it up. I believe that He has given me what I need to do everything that He's asked me to do, and He's given it to me lavishly, that I don't have this view of God that He's withholding, that I'll never be able to get what I need out of Him so that I can fulfill my destiny. But I believe He's already given it to me. And when I quit doubting it, I'll be able to rejoice in what I already have. He's commissioned me to proudly serve in a kingdom. I don't see this as a two-power universe, and I don't see that um, I need to be afraid that the devil's kingdom is going to take over forever. I think some people believe more in the devil's kingdom and his ability to take over than they do in the third great awakening that there will be um, great revival on the earth that when Jesus comes back will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And I believe that he has commissioned me to proudly serve in this kingdom that cannot be shaken. We partner as true peacemakers, and sometimes we're called to confront evil and compromise. But that is true peacemaking, that I don't have to sweep things under the rug, that God's not an unreal God that pretends that things are okay, that it's when He tells me to, that it's okay for me to confront as long as my attitude is one of restoration and reconciliation. I believe that Christ in me is powerful to take the kingdom by force, even the Bible says, that I have power and authority over demonic spirits, and I don't have to worry and to fret and to be anxious. Anxiety was a big problem of mine in the past because I have power over them. He fills me with confidence then to be faithful in all that He says for me to do, all that He says for me to say, I have that confidence because I have a clear conscience and because if He asks me to do it or He asks me to say it, He will enable me to do it. And I can also leave the results to Him. I can leave the results to Him. People don't always have an immediate positive reaction even if you're speaking the voice of the Lord even if you're doing exactly what he said to do in his way and in his timing, they don't always respond positively first, but I can leave the results to him because I'm learning to trust him implicitly. His strength enables me to endure hardship as a good soldier because I know who he is now and I know who I am in Christ, that when I do receive persecution or some hardship, as I'm acting as a soldier in the kingdom of God, I can endure that with grace, whereas before I would have felt like the victim. <laughs> I would have felt like he was picking on me or wasn't there for me. Now I can share in the cup of his suffering. And he can let me share in the cup of his suffering. I can suffer for his sake sometimes, which is sometimes a much louder testimony than when things are going well. You know, when you can suffer with grace and still trust God and still have peace, that's a much lighter testimony. People are drawn to peace like a magnet. He rejoices as I step out in my gifts, and He gives them to me in full measure, and He give them, gives them liberally, and He wants me to covet more. He says, covet the best gifts. And so I don't need to worry about what someone else is doing. I don't need to worry about competing with anyone else, that there's enough to go around. And he rejoices as I step out in my gifts because he knows that my heart is to pant after him and it's not for my glory but for his. He fills me with grace for effective working in his mighty power. See, as I have a clear conscience, my faith can grow, my confidence in Him can grow. As His love perfects me and casts out of my fear, I can step out 
and pray for miracles. I can pray for healing. I can leave the results to Him. And I can enjoy partnering with God. Amen? I know His heart is to heal and to restore and to reconcile and to empower us all to live a victorious Christian life. And if we're not living an abundant life, we can ask Him why not and He will tell us. He gives me discernment so that I can discern what is not Him. I don't have to be afraid of being blindsided and deceived all the time. This is a big challenge that I had and I would feel so bad when I was deceived by someone. But now I have confidence in Him that His desire is to give me wisdom liberally, to give me true spiritual discernment, and I can overcome with God's truth that the truth not only makes me free, but as I speak the truth to others that... You know, it's just my line that he gives me to say, he says, open your mouth, fill it with this line, and I do. But he does the other 99%, his truth does make them free. He fills me with grace for the effective working of his mighty power. It's not a harsh thing anymore. I used to have kind of a sarcastic tongue, and I still have to work on that temptation at times. But... God will take our tongue, anything that we lay on the altar, amen, and He will redeem it. He will make our weak places to strong. strong. So He is filling me with His grace, filling me with mercy for others, filling me with true compassion, filling me with empathy instead of just sympathy for people. I don't take up their offense. I have true empathy, and I'm able to minister with them and to them. In gratitude, I preach the gospel with authority. I don't have to come apologetically. I don't have to just be tolerant or politically correct. I can come in the authority of Jesus Christ who is in me. Christ in me is the mystery of the gospel. That's why I'm not lacking anything. That's why I'm complete in Christ because He's inside. That I'm dwelling in Him and He's in me. He gave me everything, but He also gave up everything for me. That's the kind of God I have who would give up everything and become a human being, give up all his rights, think it not any big thing to give all that up and demonstrate how much he loves me, that he can relate to every feeling, every emotion, every temptation, every challenge I have, and I am understood. I have a God who understands and he came in person to prove it. So I expend myself to feed his sheep. I expend myself to feed his sheep. I use much of my free time to spend uh, on his purposes, his vision. I ask God when I'm in my quiet time in the morning, when I'm listening to him, I call it the staff meeting in the morning and let him take me anywhere he wants to take me. Lou and I have our devotions together from like between 6.30 and 7.30 and then sometimes I just continue on and I journal and I hear what God's prayers are. What is He concerned about? I let Him reorder my day because I trust Him to set my day and to set my priorities and to order my feet. Amen? So in gratitude, I preach His gospel with authority because I believe that Jesus is the best even if there were many other choices. I believe that we can trust in His love, that He's absolutely the best. I don't want reincarnation. I don't want more chances to try to get this right. I don't want to have to earn it. I don't want a treadmill you know, of, of performance. I believe that God really does love me and accept me just like I am, that He forgives me for everything. He redeems everything. That's what I want. I love Him. He gave me everything, and now He sows liberally to me, into me more and more. He's constantly making deposits in me. He's extending me more grace. He's trusting me with more things, knowing that I won't always get it right, and I just love it that His love for me never changes when I don't get it right, but that He is trusting me that I will be a good steward of the abilities, the talents, the gifts, and the fruit that He's growing in me, and that I will multiply it. And so I choose to. You know, when somebody believes in you, they believe that you're improving or that you can do it, or that you have potential, how you'll become a better steward of the talents you've got, like the woman that, that convinced me that I could paint, and I've believed I can ever since. He ministers through me, encouraging others in their spiritual gifts. 
Amen? And even though none of us are perfect, He chooses to limit Himself most of the time to ministering through us to encourage them. And in our imperfection, it is an encouragement because I know probably several of you have said, if He'll use her, I know He'll use me. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we're not even just being used. We're the bride and He's the groom. It's a partnering. It's a joint account. It's whatever He asks me to do, I know the money is there. I don't have to worry about it. I'm not the stepchild that has to beg. I'm not disowned. I'm not in fear of separation. He gives me everything I need liberally. His hands are in my hands to lay hands on others. God believes in points of contact. He's not like that father that never touched you or held you or gave you appropriate touch. God believes in contacting people. Now, in this day and time, we need to ask their permission. There's so many people, at least one-fourth of the people, they say, have been physically, if not sexually, abused. And so we need to ask people if they're okay with that. Because some people have been so abused that as soon as you touch them, confusion comes in their mind, and all they can do is focus on what kind of touch it is, and they don't even hear what you say or how you minister to them. But if you ask and they're okay with it, may I highly recommend that you only touch their shoulder. Don't call anything else their shoulder. <laughs> Don't touch people's faces unless God specifically directs you to because it's too intimate. We want to compliment the ministry that God wants to do, not distract them from it. I have a, on occasion with a woman that I knew touched her knee or something, but be careful about all other areas but just the top of the shoulder. But God lays hands on people through me. Now, if you need to pray for a body part and it's not the shoulder, maybe they have a friend or somebody they trust there, you can put your hand on top of their hand. Or maybe you can ask them. Or maybe they can put their hand there and you put your hand on top of their hand. But there is a way. God touches people through me. I look at my hands every now and then and I say, Jesus Christ's hands are inside these hands. And I'm receiving what he says, that Christ is in me, the mystery of the gospel. He ministers and encourages people in their spiritual gifts. The Bible says that we can lay hands on others and we can impart to them. It's not that I have a gift to give to them, but the Holy Spirit in me, whose hand is in my hand, can lay hands on them and encourage them in their spiritual gifts. And the Bible says, impart gifts if the Holy Spirit so leads you. His mind is in my mind, filling me with His love and power and a sound mind. I really am receiving the fact that I have the mind of Christ. I'm not worrying that I won't be able to think of it. I don't say that my memory doesn't work anymore. I don't cut down my intellect. I'm believing that what I don't have in the natural, I do have in the supernatural. And so if I don't have natural knowledge that I need for something God's asked me to do, that He will give me words of knowledge. If I don't have natural wisdom to know how to proceed next, that God will give me words of wisdom. If I don't have discernment that I need to know what choice to make or who to minister with, for instance, that I have spiritual discernment in Him, I'm believing that when I don't know how to pray, that God will minister prophetically through me. There's no indication in the Bible that we only have one gift. It's just one more bit of language that the enemy tries to get us to use. What is your gift? To make people think you only get one. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit gives gifts, plural, severally as He will, according to His purposes. The Holy Ghost is the one filling me with the power to be a witness. I believe if we will wait, we will get more and more power to be a witness. There has to be this balance. You know, when God tells you to step out, it's time to go to somewhere and witness or be involved. That's the time to do it. But clearly the Bible says, like in Acts 1-8 and many other places, the priority is to wait. Excuse me, wait on the Holy Spirit to value the anointing, to not to want to go out in our own strength or just what we've learned from a class or a program on witnessing, but to wait on the Holy Spirit to endue us with power on a high. And I believe there is all the difference in the world between a person who waits on the Lord for the anointing, amen, and a person that's just saying what they know or what they think. 
The Holy Ghost is the one that's filling me with that power to do everything. So I don't need to worry about being inadequate or insecure because He's filling me to overflowing. And the Lord is my best encourager. He's not only on my side and I'm on His side. He not only has my best interest at heart, but He's my best encourager. Nobody believes in me like Father God does. We need to get that way down deep in our spirit. Nobody believes in me like He does. God will resist the proud, but He will give grace to me when I'm humble. And so I can believe that I will have that grace. The Bible says He promotes the humble, that if I humble myself before Him in true humility, that says, yes, sir, you know, yes, sir, that He will promote me. He will give me connections. He will put me in places that I don't deserve to be. He will give me undeserved favor. He will, uh, when I'm not next, He can make me next. Or when I don't uh, qualify for something, He can make me qualify. Or He can change the hearts of those who choose. So I say what the Father says to say with great boldness of speech because my confidence is in Him now. I'm believing what the Word says and I say what the Father says to say. The Lord is on my side and I will not be afraid and so I don't need to worry about what people will do to me, what they will say, what they will choose. Even in these end times, I believe the safest place I can be is saying what the Father says to say and doing what the Father says to do. Amen? It may not look safe. <laughs> Some of the circumstances may not look safe, but it's a whole lot safer than being in disobedience. So He promotes me, and I don't need to jockey for position or power or prestige. I don't need to worry about um, material or temporal things that none of those will have anything to do with my eternal placement. But I believe that this is the triumphs and that God is giving me opportunities for promotion. He's giving me pop tests almost daily, it seems like. Today I had another challenge to trust in Him and His sovereignty. I felt like maybe I had not heard Him correctly and there was a temptation to, to, to go into doubt and unbelief about my ability to hear God. But I believe God lets things happen. He doesn't change, but He lets things happen to see if we'll be willing to turn on a dime when He says turn. Amen. He'll let challenges happen, so we'll keep looking to Him for that direction. He has given me power over demonic spirits, and they are subject to me. We need to repent of any fear of evil. Any fear of evil. I have Christ in me, who is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. And I have Him in me, and I have absolutely no reason to fear evil unless I come into agreement with evil. And you know, the devil does beat up his own people. So I don't want to be in agreement with evil, and I have no reason to fear it. Jesus took my shame, and He gives me favor. What a deal. It's not Jesus that shames me. It's not Father God that shames me. It's not Him that's... Um, down on me. All those are lies and deceptions. I let Jesus take my shame. And in Isaiah 61, 6 and 7, so he says, if you'll give me your shame, I will give you an inheritance among the nations, and I will bless you with a double portion. Many of us quote that double portion verse, but we haven't really given him our shame. We haven't really believed that we're totally forgiven. Amen. And when we start believing that I'm the chosen of God, I'm totally forgiven. He's made me holy, righteous, and blameless according to Ephesians 1 and Romans 5. When I receive the righteousness of God, I let Him have my sin and my shame. I let Him have access to every weakness and every hurt and every wound to heal them and to make them strong. Then I can rejoice knowing that blessing is coming. I'm standing under the fountain of God's blessing and He's going to give me not only a portion, but a double portion. Amen? Jesus is, has made me worthy by what He did on the cross. None of this is true because I'm anybody special at all or I've done one thing to earn it. There is nothing I can do to increase God's love for me or His acceptance for me. But He has made me holy, righteous, and blameless because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and He makes me overcome by the blood of the Lamb. As long as I keep believing in the blood of Jesus that it hasn't lost its power, that there's no mistake that I can make that will make the blood of Jesus lose its power, 
then I can get on with believing God for who He is, that it's been His desire to give me this power and spiritual authority, to make me holy, righteous, and blameless, to give me the confidence that I'm totally forgiven, that I'm valuable in His sight, and that I can expect to be able to walk in His gifts more, to grow the fruit, to be an ambassador of Him, and to be a reflection of His glory and a demonstration of His love and power to a hungry world. If you can't relate to any of that, <laughs> be sure to look up all the verse references that I'm going to be including with the handout. And let the Word of God wash away your doubts and fears. Let the Word of God baptize you with fire if you need it to burn up the chaff and all the things you believe that aren't so. But then let it baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with His power and the power to be a witness. And let's begin to enjoy the wonderful relationship that God meant all along for us to have. Amen? Let's begin to enjoy it. And Father, we just confess tonight that we have been deceived by the enemy, and we've hesitated to believe in you and who you really are. But we choose now to begin to believe the Word of God over every experience or every other influence we've had and to begin to enjoy our relationship with you to the fullest extent. And Lord, we just covenant with you in the next 40 days to declare and decree these spiritual truths and to meditate on your word. You ask us to meditate not just morning, not just night, but morning, noon, and night. And to meditate on your word and to begin to receive you. We say we've received Christ, but have we? We've received our salvation, but maybe we just need to choose again tonight just to receive you and who you really are, your love, your forgiveness, and all that you've promised us, and to know that it's available to any believer. We just need to choose to receive it, and tonight we choose to receive it, and we know that you will finish everything that you've begun in us because it was your idea in the first place, and we praise you for it. Amen.